Try again, and we'll see if it's working. Okay, so we just started recording again. So now we're officially recording. So thank you to everybody who has joined us so far. Um, I'm seeing more people trickle in, but I'll go ahead and get started. Um, for folks who didn't hear my housekeeping spiel in the beginning, go ahead and rename yourself with your first and last name and your affiliation. And then also put that same information in the chat box of yourself and anybody else who is participating on your device. And also let me know if you do not have audio. Go ahead and put that information in the chat box. So I am going to... Okay, I am going to go ahead and share my screen. Okay, so can everybody see my screen right now? Yes. I usually, you can see it? Okay. I usually do these meetings in our conference room. This is the first time I'm actually doing it with the two monitors recording, so I'm hoping that everything works well. Let me know if something isn't right, though, because I don't know. All righty. So you all should have an agenda. I did tweak it a little bit, but not too terribly much. So the agenda looks like this, and it will just mirror what our um, presentation is today, just like our previous meeting. So if you don't have it in front of you, do not worry. So the purpose of today's meeting is to discuss draft one and to talk about peer group updates that we have. Um, we do have some news about some peer groups, so hang tight for that. Um, we're also going to be planning for the next steps of our planning phase for this CAP. So um, the biggest piece that I wanted to talk about was talking about draft one, which is, um, fingers crossed, going to be submitted today to DEP to go through their CAST model so that we can get some kind of estimation of what our load reductions are based on what we've culminated so far. So that should take about a week, a week and a half. So uh, from there, we'll be able to really calibrate what our next steps are for our projects after that point. So it's a big milestone for our project. I'm very pleased with where it's at right now. Um, we also are going to be using the pull function today. So the pull function is pretty easy. It's a lot easier than doing the reactions function like I was trying last month. Um, with the pull function, it, I have two questions that I'll ask you. And you, it doesn't really give you an option to do anything but answer the questions. It's very self-explanatory, um, it's the question and then the answers that you can choose and then you just click it and submit it and it's done. And then I see the results on my end. So just know that that's going to come up. I have the questions in your agenda that I'll be asking. So um, if you don't see it or you're not really sure how to answer the questions, just refer back to your agenda and um, Either email me your answers or put them in the chat box, whichever works best for you, because I am interested in hearing your responses. Um, we will also, so going back to these meeting goals, uh, we'll be discussing draft one, and the three things that we'll be discussing in particular is quantifying these projects to be able to put them through this CAS model algorithm um, so essentially, you need to have a numeric value attached to whatever project we have um, on deck for our CAP. We can also talk about leveraging resources. I'm less concerned about the, the monetary resources and more interested in figuring out how do we leverage technical resources for these projects. Um, I'd also like to talk about how do we solidify partnerships so that we do have a sustainable model for implementation as we move forward with this plan 
because as we know, this is more so programmatic. These are programmatic changes that we're making. And so we have to make sure that we have some kind of structure for these partnerships that we are either creating or solidifying so that it's just easy moving forward with these projects. So those are big things that I wanted to talk about today. So meeting agenda, these updates, draft one planning, and then we can talk about any questions or concerns you have. Um, this is really open-ended. Uh, if you have questions or concerns about the, uh, how the projects go into the model, um, how we move forward with our process, uh, open-ended, please feel free. And then we can talk more about specifically next steps that we'll be doing. So, okay. So updates, our resources peer group will be absorbed into the other peer groups. You should have gotten an email from me recently about what uh, different peer groups the folks that were in the resources peer group will be absorbed into. Um, I have heard back from a few of you about wanting to adjust which peer groups I just kind of assigned you in based either randomly or based on what kind of interests or skills you've had that you've um, let me know about from previous meetings. So let me know if you um, are able to attend the ones that I did send to you. Um, you should be getting future notices in invitations, um, just updating the stakeholder lists for those emails. So let me know. But um, just know that from here on out, that resources peer group will be dissolved. Um, we can always come back to it, but for now, that's gonna be our strategy. Also, we have a newsletter. Our first new newsletter came out last month, um, and that is on the website. It's just a PDF document, two pages. It's not too big. It's not gonna crash your computer if you open it. Um, so uh, another newsletter will be coming out at the end of this month, so tomorrow um, is our time frame for getting that out. Um, and keep an eye out for those. It essentially has updates to the cap, interesting things going on in the area around water quality and load reductions. We have highlights for different BMPs going on in the area. Um, and it also highlights some pretty neat cartography that we were able to um, develop that's related to CAP projects that we'll be doing. So it's pretty cool, I'm proud of it. Um, so check it out on the website when you get a chance. Um, it's, I'm pretty proud of it, so just so you know. So let's move on to draft one planning. Um, I have our culminated list of projects that I'm gonna pop up here. Can everybody see that document? Yes. Okay, great. So what I wanted to do was talk a bit about those things that we were discussing earlier. How do we quantify these projects? How do we leverage resources? How do we solidify partnerships? These are things that I want us to think about. Specifically, I want to look at quantifying projects. I sent this out to you last week, maybe two weeks ago. It has changed a bit since, but structurally everything is basically the same. So it may look a little bit different than the version that you have in your emails. Um, what I wanna do is open the floor up to see if there's anything that you all wanted to talk about first. I have some, I have one, two, three, four, five, projects that I can pick uh, to talk about because I think that there's there's some projects here that are very multi-dimensional and we could definitely talk a long time about them, but I wanted to open up the floor and see if you all had anything that you wanted to bring up first. So project, quantifying the projects, um, things like additional acres by a certain date, um, linear feet, um, so quantifying the projects, how do we leverage resources effectively, how do we solidify partnerships? Anything that you'd like to bring up? Uh, 
this is this is Mel Zimmerman, uh, Lycoming College. Um, we have a potential project. We have a, a field station, um, 116 acres um, on Loyal Sock Creek. Uh, we we are looking into some grants for a project there that I think might um, could be added to this list. So is this list flexible? Could we? Could I get something absolutely. to you? Okay. Yes, absolutely. Okay, so um, I'll, I'll email you and make sure what we're thinking is is you you know, might fit into this. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Mel. I appreciate it. I'll look out for that email. Anything else? Any specific projects that you had a burning desire to talk about? If not, I will bring up the ones that I had pre-selected. All right. Let's talk about turf field nutrient management. This text, so there's different color codings right now. So I have some text that's highlighted in yellow. That's an indicator to me to either look something up in the future or get information from somebody else. So that's what that color code means. The blue text is information that I used from Center County's CAP document that I thought was, could easily be applicable for our cap, so that's just why this text is in blue. It's just from Center County's um, cap document. So let's talk about this one: turf field nutrient management. It's pretty broad. The idea is to reduce the amount of nutrients that are a being applied to turf fields, big turf fields like um, like I'm thinking ball fields, I'm thinking golf courses, I'm thinking, um, you know, churches and hospitals and cemeteries have big swaths of green carpet. And the idea is to help reduce the amount of fertilizer nutrients that are running off of those places. So how do we quantify this? What's the goal that we can look for? I know it's, it might be hard to really be able to quantify these things based on an arbitrary idea. I mean, it, it, you're kind of throwing a dart at a board and kind of just seeing where it sticks, but it gives us a goal to look for. It's also hard because we don't have a grant in front of us that gives us specific metrics that we'll be using. So understanding that that is what we're working with do you think there's any way that we can really quantify this right now? X number of acres, um, X number of um, property owners by a certain year. Or how do we leverage partnerships or get resources for this particular project? Eve, this is Rod Moore. Um, we have several high schools in Lycoming College that have put turf fields in. Um, there should be some kind of credit for that that goes in the model, I would think. Mm -hmm. Putting down X amount of nutrients before. Now it's artificial turf. They don't have to do that. Mm hmm um, might not be something Wonder, huge, but. Yeah. What could I put that under? Would that be under performance targets or resources? Maybe 
coming up with under performance targets. So how would I write this down, Rod? Maybe quantify artificial market? turf acres or, or something like that. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Nope. That's helpful. We'll need mapping for that, some kind of data. What else? What other resources do we have available for something like this? Or partnerships? How do we get this on the ground? Could also move on to another one if you'd like to do that and just think about this one. I'm happy to do that. These are kind of nebulous and that's why I picked them. Because I wanted to get your input and I wanted to hear what you were thinking about these projects. So let's go ahead and I will just highlight this one so that I remember we were looking at it. All right, there's another center county. Public-private farm BMP sponsorship program. I found this from center county's cap and I wanted to bounce the idea off of you all to see if you like the idea. So use the REIT program to leverage funding, sponsor farmers who perform BMPs, and pay them cash from tax rebates that corporations receive from funding the program. What do you think about this one? Do you have any experience with this? Do you know anything about it? Do you like the idea? Uh, two examples I can think of, Mount Joy down in Lancaster area, they bought no-till equipment for a farmer to use the reductions towards their um, nutrient cap. And also in Lancaster area, Turkey Hill, as a program for their farmers that through one or two co-ops that they pay for the implementation of best management practices and they help pay for getting conservation plans done and stuff like that. And it worked pretty well. I think the idea would be pretty good for us. Uh, or is it completely off the mark? You have to find a company that would be interested in doing something. Right. Mm -hmm. Like our treatment plants are all to the point where they're not buying nitrogen credits. I don't know if they buy phosphorus credits. So the Matt Joy thing probably doesn't apply here. Mm -hmm. But, um, we don't have a big ag industry. Mm -hmm. where, um, that has like a warm, fuzzy, hey, look what we're doing thing. We have lenders, but I don't think, mm -hmm. <coughs> I don't think they have any way to gain by like, hey, all our wheat is no-till or 
conservation college, you know, where turkey mm -hmm. hope is like, hey, we have healthier cows because they're not hanging out in slop. Mm -hmm. So do you think it would be something that may not be quite as successful in our area? Like, I don't think, I can't think of any logical partners right off the top of my head, but okay. I wouldn't say it would never happen. Mm -hmm. You just never know. Yeah. Yeah. Shannon, this is Bill Burdett. Uh, it's either at the Conservation District office or NCRS out at the county farm. They have one or two seed drills that they'll lend out to farmers, cabins, so that the seed drill ID already exists. Okay. Anyone else? Keep it, ditch it, talk about it a little bit more later. Let's bring it up in the ag, next ag group meeting. Okay, sounds good. This is uh, Jackie Kerstetter. Um, something to consider and that we plan to talk about next week with our conservation districts is that um, we have seen some districts uh, utilize a Growing Greener grant to provide incentivized payments for farmers to do things like cover crops. Um, and again, we do plan on, on talking about this option with all of our conservation districts uh, next week. Um, again, just some, an option for them to consider if they want to, uh, you know, utilize a Growing Greener grant in that manner. Um, and the, the district that actually holds that Growing Greener grant right now has partnered with three other conservation districts. So mm -hmm. it's a multi-county incentivized program. And again, it is for planting cover crops. Um, Columbia County is, is uh, the sponsor of that grant and they do have a brochure out uh, to provide information to their farmers about the program. Um, if you'd be interested in taking a look at it, I could probably share it with you. Um, yes, please. So just, uh, Again, this isn't a, a REAP type of program, which you do have listed in your um, spreadsheet there, but it's you know, another option for you to consider. Gotcha, okay, that's helpful, thank you. You're welcome. I think what Center County, what you're referring to here in this, this program would be somebody like Blaze Alexander wants tax credits. So mm -hmm. then they will pay for BMPs on the farm, the farmer gets the tax credits who in turn gives them to Blaze for him to use. So Blaze gets tax credits, the farmer gets paid for their practices. That's what this is. So it would be a matter of finding someone like Blaze or some other larger business people that could throw out money for practices and then wait for tax credits to come in. Mm -hmm. That's that's what this program is. So it would take a little bit of digging and, and hobnobbing with the wealthier business owners, but it's, it, it's a possibility here. Mm -hmm. I haven't really heard of many examples of this happening. I know there's a way to get it, get a bank involved and basically the, the bank will float the loan, so to speak, but then the bank gets the, so they pay out for all the practices, but then the bank retains all the tax credits in the end. Mm -hmm. So it's out there, I just don't know details of how this works. Gotcha, so it might be a situation where we would be doing a lot of research and a lot of lifting for maybe not a substantial return within the next five years. It could be on individual farms, you know, if, if 
we're talking about it could be substantial amount of money and it'd be a, another tool another way to get some projects done because mm -hmm. maybe the okay. farmer doesn't have the ability to spend all that money up front and wait for tax credits themselves but some corporate business might mm -hmm. gotcha okay so we can look into it a little bit further All right, let's move on. Oh, I'm going to highlight this. Let's move on to another one. So this guy, I'm trying to find a way to have the headings for you so you can still see what the headings are. That might work. All right, expand interagency collaboration. This is one where we may not get a lot of return on our investment up front, but it very well could leverage partnerships and resources like I was talking about before. Uh, I think that this is one that I'm taking really seriously, not that I'm not taking other projects very seriously, but this one I think is important to prop up like a, you know, like a three-legged stool. This is one of the legs that's gonna prop up this project is increasing and expanding interagency collaboration. So is there anything else that we can quantify, leverage, or um, expand on this partnership? How do we sustain this partnership? Is there a way to quantify this? A lot of partners in there. What resources do we have available? to make collaboration easier, to make it sustainable. Do we need money to do that? Do we need more capacity? Some kind of marketing? Do we want more meetings? I think we almost need to have a point person to reach out individually to all these different groups and see what they're up to that the rest of us could be involved in. So maybe mm -hmm. a, a resource needed would be someone's staff time, mm -hmm. whether that would be a nonprofit or uh, an intern of, of the county or something like that. Someone dedicated to holding all these things together. Yeah. So this is Renee. I, I think the reality is the collaboration a lot of times just happens organically because people are willing to communicate with each other and talk about what they're doing. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I think the, the, re, the reality also is organizations with staff um, are going to be able to move things ahead a little bit easier than organizations that are all volunteer. Um, I think mm -hmm. the all volunteer organizations definitely have a role 
and a, a purpose, but um, I, I think a lot of our volunteer organizations right now are struggling to find people who are willing to serve as board members and then to have the skills and the expertise and the connection as well as just the time. You know, they're a volunteer, so they're doing other stuff um, with the majority of their time, and especially if they're still working. So to be able yeah. to make a lot of this stuff happen is just, you know, difficult for an all-volunteer organization. So, you know, figuring out who can shepherd the project through and um, do that communication is going to be somewhat different in each situation. Mm -hmm. Thank you, that's helpful. Hey, this is Lori Douglas. Uh, I, I, I agree with uh, what Renee just said because uh, we're a small township, you know, and, and I, to be honest, I didn't even know a lot of this was available to us, you know, to, uh, to utilize. So I guess I need to, I, for my purposes, since we're doing this on, yeah, I'm doing this on my time. I also need to have, uh, you know, a meeting scheduled so I know what's going on. And it's really been helpful for me to see what, you know, Lycoming County actually is doing because we just mm -hmm. aren't quite, you know, aware of all that. Since we do not have staff, you know, it's just, it's just a, it's a Yeah, so Lori, that's a good point because a lot of these smaller townships and municipalities are very limited in the amount of time that they're available to just do work. And so if there is a way that you can think of um, that can be respectful of people's very limited time and also get the message across that, you know, collaboration and partnerships are a foundation of how we just do good work in the county and beyond. Um, however, we can get that message across and be a partner with these entities, let me know, because uh, that's, a, that's a big priority. Does anyone have any ideas about ways to streamline permit processes? That was something that lots of folks brought up. We, so there's a, people are frustrated by duplicative work and they want to streamline permitting processes. What kind of advice do you have or ideas do you have for that specific work? Anything else? I can move on. All right. How about this one? Improving and expanding technical assistance. Kind of in the same vein as the previous one that we just talked about, but a little different. There is an NACD technical assistance grant. I don't know the time frames of that, or I think it's an annual thing for basically for conservation districts to hire people for this kind of thing. Unfortunately, oh, nice. unfortunately to write conservation plans, you need to go through about two years of training. So if you hire someone for a one year term or something like that, it doesn't necessarily work, but there is a technical assistance grant. Maybe we should look into that further. 
Nice. Um, I'm going to put that, I don't know where to put that in there under financial. I'll put it under financial. NACD is the National Association of Conservation Districts, in case anyone didn't know that. Yeah, I'll write that out, actually. Probably many of you didn't know that. <laughs> yeah. I know we can talk a lot about this one. You gotta have something, I know it. What kind of resources do we need that are not available? Money. And this could be about anything. This can be technical assistance for um, helping with permits, um, helping um, communities get more trails on the ground, um, helping landowners build buffers. Um, I mean, it's just a whole multifaceted broad category that you can go in any direction in. Time and money. Time and money. Well, and I don't know if this is Renee again. I don't know if this would fit here or not, but when I'm thinking about resources available, you know, one of the things I keep thinking about is because I'm sitting in on multiple counties cap plans, um, is what in this plan does the county need to do a loan? And there's enough interest right now to do a loan. And where are there opportunities for, you know, someone to house um, a technical assistance provider that is working in multiple counties. And, you know, maybe today is helping um, Rod and Tim with some planning that they don't, that, you know, their plates are too full. They have a landowner who's interested and tomorrow this person is going to be in Montour County working with a landowner there and the day after that Union County or something. Um, so I, I this may not be the time and place to start kind of identifying those things, but I think it's something to keep in mind is that, you know, multiple counties, all the counties, not multiple, all the counties in this region are going through the same process. So where are there opportunities to, to partner and work together um, and not have to go it alone? Yes. So Renee, yes. you want one more staff person? Not necessarily. <laughs> Um, <laughs> I mean, that would be an idea, but I'm just thinking about, you know, some of the other, some of the other things we do, right, and um, how, how, you know, technical assistance is provided across county lines, and, you know, one county may only need one type of plan, but another county might have four or five landowners, just Again, there's there's a lot here, and to be sitting here thinking we have to do all of this ourselves or alone um, is definitely overwhelming. And since we were just talking about collaboration and partnerships, um, <clears throat> it seems like a good place to point out that you know mm -hmm. there may not be enough interest in trails, for instance, in Lycoming County to have somebody who's providing technical assistance on that. But if you look at multiple counties we can get technical assistance here from somebody for that purpose. Yeah, that is a great point. I'm going to add that to interagency collaboration too. Thank you. This is Larry Brannick. Uh, just to uh, piggyback on that, <clears throat> if we found a way to provide technical assistance, especially in the stream restoration arena, um, you could have one person centrally located in a region uh, serving multiple counties, providing uh, assistance in design of projects and also permitting 
uh, that would be one way to streamline your permitting process is if you had a, a resource person that uh, could help people prepare and uh, do a preliminary review uh, of permits. Yes. This is Renee Same. again. To Larry's point, the Fish and Boat Commission has three additional stream habitat staff who are funded through EPA. And the purpose of these three staff positions is to work on projects to reduce sediment in the Chesapeake Bay. Um, so they can provide design, construction oversight, um, some permit assistance because they also review, Fish and Boat also reviews permits. So they can help to a point and then it becomes a slight conflict of interest. So um, that would be something yeah. that is an existing resource now. Gotcha. Great. Let's They'll review out. DP1 permits. Correct. They review, review GP1. Um, I think, don't they get to provide input and comments on other permits that relate to certain levels of streams? Um, Usually they'll come out in, at a uh, pre-app meeting and lend input. Uh, but I don't know that, say for a joint permit, I'm not sure they're included in the review process. Anything else? Am I missing anything? Okay. Good, good, good. All right, last one that I picked out to look at. Dirt and gravel roads. I picked 200 new dirt and gravel road projects by 2025. Um, and then there's the, the way that the BMP, the best management practice is quantified. It, there's various ways you can do it. Um, and I think the linear feet makes a lot of sense. So, you can also think in miles as well. What do you think? What ways can we expand this program? What kind of partnerships can we leverage to expand it? How do we make it better? Well, I mean, the funding that the Conservation District receives every year is a set number. And we always have about three times the application dollars as the funding we get. So it's, you know, we get somewhere around $500,000 and that includes the staff person's time. And we have, I don't know what it is, one and a half to $2 million of applications every year. So the, the biggest limit there is the funding not the project availability or willing townships or anything like that. Gotcha. You're putting that in the wrong line there. Thank you. And the, the funding is available or it, no, put down one row. You're in stormwater impacts from clear cutting. As well. Oh, I see what you're saying. <clears throat> The funding Thank is allocated you. based on how many miles of dirt and gravel road we have and those kind of things. So from, uh, at least from the State Conservation Commission side, we can't increase that. Mm. But maybe there's other ways to get funding for projects like that. I mean, I guess maybe. So great. there's no way to increase, there's no way to increase the funding that the Conservation District gets. Unless we would apply for outside grants or something like that. But it's a program that is funded based on a formula and 
here's what you get every year. Do we have any municipalities that have anything to add here? What would make this easier? Like many of these, more funding, more staff. Okay. Uh, this, this is Mike Miller. I, I guess I'm confused. What, what does the dirt and gravel roads program? This may be a very basic question, but how does this reduce nitrogen and phosphorus? It's sediment. Um, basically where dirt and gravel roads are eroding into a stream or where uh, a cross pipe is undersized. So when the, when the water gets high, it comes out the bottom gushing like a garden hose and blows everything out for significant stream footage downstream, which is also a sediment issue there. So it's all based on sediment. Uh, if, the, if there's no water quality benefit to it, then the project's not eligible. So it's basically you're looking where the dirt and gravel roads go along a stream or wetland or something like that. I got you. Thank, thank you. Appreciate that explanation. Yep. Thanks, Mike. Because you're probably not the only one thinking that. So that's a, that's a valuable question for sure. Anything else before we move on? Okay. Alrighty. That is all I've got for ones that I picked out. So we can move on. And if you have anything you want to add, let me know. But I'll push that over and we'll go back to our presentation. Okay, so now here's where our prioritization poll comes into play. So it's two questions. I'm going to see if I can pull this up. I had it queued up for us, so hopefully it's easy. All right. There you go. So you all should see those questions. Number one, what do you think is the best way to prioritize projects? This is multiple choice. Highest load reduction, lowest cost, most public buy-in, least amount of time it would take to finish, most co-benefits or something else. Another idea that uh, folks had was to have some kind of scoring sheet uh, for projects where certain qualities a project may have are assigned a numeric value. So that way that there, it's not really like a black box. So my hope for that would be to kind of remove any kind of subjectivity and it would just be a score sheet. So um, if you think that's a good idea, let me know. And if you do respond something else, 
write your response in the chat function if you don't have audio. Um, if you do have audio and you want to talk about it, feel free. It's an open forum. Let me know what your thoughts are because this is going to be very important to how we implement these projects. This is Renee again. Um, I clicked something else. I think the best way to prioritize projects is not where you have the most public buy-in, but where you have the most landowner buy-in. And I'm differentiating gotcha. between that because the reality is we're going to have to work with private landowners um, to make a lot of this happen. And if they're not, if they're not already at a point of go. Um, you know, you need to do the outreach and communication to get them to go, but you need to start where you have the yeses and do the outreach parallel to working on those people that are already at yes. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Yeah, that's an important distinction. And then with this, um, we can go back to the prioritization, but for this implementation peer group, so my hope for this implementation peer group is to have an even representation of all the other peer groups. Um, and let me know, I, my goal is to have any decision that's made, um, I mean, in any of the peer groups, but especially the implementation peer group. I want it to not feel like a black box. I want to make sure that anything that we talk about or discuss or choose is also discussed with the larger group of stakeholders. So if you ever do feel like there isn't transparency, let me know. Um, that is the complete opposite of what I want this to feel like. So this is really just a way to, to get representation from other peer groups into one space to talk about how we implement, what's the time frame. Um, prioritizing projects. Um, I want to make sure that that's transparent. So that's my idea for this group. Does anybody want to talk about that? Does anyone have any other ideas? This is Larry Branica again. Um, we did something like this when we had a congressional grant uh, in the northeast counties, um, and we had a, a list of potential projects. I think there were 23 on the list, and so I created a matrix and made a list of the decision points that we would use, much like you have here on your poll, and then we assigned weights to each one of those and you wound up doing a scoring um, one to five or one to ten on say you know the load reduction potential and then whatever weight that had you multiplied by the weight and then you added up for a total score and those projects that had the highest score were your higher priority projects yeah and that works pretty well. A feeling for which projects we, we really wanted to, to do and, and those projects did rise to the top of the uh, prioritization. Um, we also had one project that nobody really paid that much attention to that also rose to the top. So uh, it's a way of, um, you know, it's a project you may not think has that much benefit. It's a way of uh, identifying uh, a hidden project like that. Mm -hmm. I've got 73% who voted. So that's pretty good. Anybody else want to talk about the something else? choice that they put down. Eve, this is Leslie. Um, now, I don't know if this would be a, a good way to, to go about it, but I was thinking perhaps you might want to start with the projects that would be um, 
I guess the easiest, maybe the things that you have the most resources and um, ideas in line for and, and just knock them out. And sometimes that helps a group gain confidence by saying, well, we got these done and sort of motivates you to move on to the more difficult projects with more obstacles. Yeah, yeah, if you see progress quickly, and efficiently, it'll make folks feel more motivated to press on as we move on. Because something that I'm aware of is that burnout is real. And I wanna make absolutely sure that folks are not getting burnout by this process. And so if we see efficient success early on, I'm hoping that that is a strategy that reduces the possibility of burnout in the future. So, yep, that's a very good point. All right, for folks who said that they did want to participate in the implementation peer group, um, do one of two things for me. Go ahead and put down your name and that you want to be in the implementation peer group in the chat box or email me, whichever works best, or give me a call. So three options, whichever is easiest for you. That's great though. I've got 13 people who said they wanted to be in the implementation peer group. I think that's a good size. 76% of folks who responded so far and we're at 89%. Anybody else want to talk about prioritization? What do you think will work? What won't work? I got 89%, I'm stuck on 89%. I'm like an auctioneer, I got one, let's get one more, let's get to 90%. One more person. I don't have an auctioneer voice. I regret that now for this very specific circumstance. All right, going once, going twice. I'll go ahead and close the poll. Alrighty. So go ahead and share the results. Lots of folks said highest load reduction. That makes sense. Um, and most co-benefits is the second most responded answer. Um, I am happy to see that because there's not just one thing. There's just not just one interest, it's a multitude, it's a, it's a holistic look at these projects to make sure that we are hitting multiple different benefits um, in just one project. So I'm happy to see that. Um, and lots of you are interested in the implementation peer group. Great. Does anything surprise you from these answers? No? Okay. All right. I'm also going to send this poll out to folks who are not with us today to make sure I get good representation. Because I know not everybody can make these meetings and that is perfectly fine. So again, let me know if you want to be in the implementation peer group in the chat. Um, through chat, through email, or give me a call and let me know. All right. What questions or concerns do you have? This can be about anything. This is just open-ended. I want to have a space for you all to talk about things that you have questions about or things that you have concerns about.
I'll give us a minute. You can also put this in the chat if you're more comfortable doing that or if you don't have audio. Going once, going twice, okay. If you have any questions or concerns moving forward, do let me know. I'll reiterate this again. I wanna make sure that this is a transparent process and you feel like you are heard and that your concerns are addressed throughout this whole process for years to come, just so you're aware. All right, so looking at next steps, our next check-in meeting is Thursday, May 27th at 9.30 a.m. And our implementation peer group, um, let me back up. So I scheduled all of our peer groups, that skeleton schedule that I talked about I know, last month, I set up all of the peer group schedules way in advance. So this is a time slot that has been established for a while. If this does not work for you, let me know. Um, the, any meetings that we have scheduled are flexible. So um, if you feel like there's a different time that you wanna meet, maybe at the end of the day, um, evening, early morning, let me know if it works better for you. Our implementation peer group meeting is set for Tuesday, May 25th from one to three, that's the Zoom. Um, recruit, always recruit, always bring in new people. I've got a few people that I need to reach out to to bring into this process. And as always, come prepared and ready for discussion. This is a participatory type forum, uh, just like all of our meetings. So um, it's here for you to share your experiences, your advice. Um, it's, so that's, that's why we have these meetings. It's important to do that. As far as planning goes, we're gonna strategize based on draft one reductions that we will hopefully get back in the next week, week and a half. Um, I'm pretty excited to see how they look. Uh, you'll be the first to know. So based on those reductions, that's what we'll be strategizing for. And then we'll also be looking more into these prioritization strategies. I think a score sheet is a good idea. It will take some planning, but I think that's just the best way to remove any subjectivity from the choices that we make. So that's, I think that's gonna be a big discussion that we have moving forward. Public engagement, we'll have some public engagement coming up pretty soon here. I'm hoping to have some, it's like a YouTube or a Zoom open house idea. Um, I'm hoping to have two of those. So one, to get the public aware that this is something that's happening. We'll send out some surveys to gauge interest in projects that we have, to gauge interest in um, if they would want to be uh, participating in anything, if they want to recruit other landowners, things like that. And if they have any concerns or advice or questions. So I'm hoping to have one of those, uh, one of the open houses in May and another one in August or September um, and also having those surveys go out. So that's my, my rough strategy for public engagement. We had a press release go out in the last couple of weeks um, and we'll probably have two more press releases go out um, to let folks know that we're looking for their input and to let folks know that we'll have a final draft that's in the future, September. And we have our second kind of internal draft that's due Thursday, June 24th. 
Same thing, it's just another round of that cast model to see what our reductions are, just to make sure that we are in good shape for September so that we don't find out we need more reductions way later in the game. So just helping us stay on track there. So draft two, end of June. If there is nothing else, I thank you all for your time. I think this was a really effective meeting and I'm glad that I got the feedback that I did get that's really, really helpful. So let me know, number one, if you wanna be in the implementation peer group, let me know. Um, and if you have any questions or concerns at all, also let me know. But otherwise, thank you so much. Enjoy this somewhat overcast and very humid day. If you have curly hair like myself, probably having a Janice Joplin day. But thank you. Thanks, Eve.